coming up today on the Donversations podcast. So that's the age old question. A lot of people ask me, it's like, how do you go from being a person from normal weight to a person that is so morbidly obese that their life was literally going to, well, it's almost over if you're at that part of your life. Right. So I will just share everything that got me to that place. So I will, there's two, two particular moments, two particular topics that I would like to talk about. Welcome to another episode of Conversations. Today we have Justin. Justin, thank you so much for being here today. My pleasure. I'm super excited. So yes, this is great. Well, as people can see in your background behind you, you did quite the transformation and I cannot wait to hear about it. I was always a huge fan of the show, The Biggest Loser. I just, it's so inspirational to me. The, the strength, the inner strength, the will, the willpower, everything that it takes to go from you, you were 800 pounds. Well, I was 799. So I was like a donut away. <laughs> so we can't really give you that much credit. Okay. <laughs> Just a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's amazing. It's amazing. Yeah. And I am so proud of you. And I'm sure everybody that knows you is so proud of you. What an inspiration. So tell me how it started. What happened? So that's the age old question. A lot of people ask me, it's like, how do you go from being a person from normal weight to a person that is so morbidly obese that their life was literally going to, well, it's almost over if you're at that part of your life. Right. So I will just share everything that got me to that place. So I will, there's two, two particular moments, two particular topics that I would like to talk about that, that really led me to be an unhealthy weight to that level. Um, Number one, it was fear and anxiety. I had fear and anxiety. So mentally, my mind was in a really bad place, frantic, afraid of death, uh, nervous, anxious, whatever you want to say, that's negative, depressed, right? So that's where I was at. And to cope with that, I had a food addiction. So when I was feeling any of those issues in my Mm -hmm. mind and my heart, whatever. Um, I would be scared, but my one comfort source that I would go to on a consistent basis at that point in my life was food and whatever was in the refrigerator, whatever was in the cupboards, whatever was at the convenience store, whatever, I would just eat it. And I found comfort in that. But the problem was it was destroying me. And that's how I started ballooning up in weight slowly, slow, actually pretty quickly because I was gorging myself with food. I mean, I, I would consume my day's worth of food probably in a half a day. Like I would, I would, what I should be, should have been eating right in a half a day. And then I would just continue to gorge the rest of the day. So no matter what it was, and we could talk about those types of food. I don't want to get too ahead of myself here, but it wasn't a good, wasn't a good, um, equation, right? It was, it was anxiety, depression, and food addiction. And you mix those together, you balloon up in some weight. Yeah. That's the perfect storm. What, but you were like a little kid when you were putting on the weight, did you have, um, and you don't have to go into too much depth, but I mean, did you deal with trauma as a child that you, that made you go towards food for comfort? I think there was a, I think there was some sort of I think where the roots come from that would be where my parents, and they're still together today, which is awesome. They've, they've overcome a lot in their lives, but they had a really rough marriage in a particular moment of their marriage. Um, okay. And so when I was a little boy, I would hear my dad and my mom arguing. And I remember just feeling that tension and mm-hmm. trying to be the mediator between the two, like mm-hmm. dad mom's not mad at you and knowing that she is right. But I try to bring them back together and I just wanted that unit to be one again. And Mm. it just felt like it wasn't right. So I, I feel like there was a lot of that. You want to call it, you know, the thoughts that go down that direction, maybe trauma, if you will, Mm -hmm. in that part of my life. And you know how sometimes thoughts just aren't a subconscious part of your mind. 
like you don't really know they're there. And as a kid, I didn't know how to explore that avenue. Right. But looking back at it, I can say, oh, there probably was some kind of link here that that made it possible, that made it so I got to this part of my weight, right? And got that big and caused the anxiety. So I'm sure there was some connection. That's what I can, that's when I can pinpoint how the anxiety may have started, but it didn't end there, right? That was just like a, maybe a starting point. Once you have that starting point, other things can trigger, other things sure. become new that take you to that place. So I'm sure there's a lot more I can unpack with that, you know? Well, yeah. And then when you go to school, I mean, you could have the most perfect little body as a little child and kids are going to find some reason to pick on you. Kids can just be awful. And so when you've got that one thing against you for your weight, you know, that's just made easy, easy for kids to pick on you. And that's a whole other, I yeah. hate that bullying business, you know, it was bad. It was bad. It, you know, the good news is I was a big boy and they didn't want to mess with me. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess there's something involved, you know, something, I guess, a benefit of being larger in some capacity. Um, but the that pro doesn't outweigh the cons that came with what my life became, right? So, uh, you know, I would be picked on by a lot of upperclassmen. A lot of my mm. friends, I mean, I had a lot of like friends, acquaintances and throughout grade school and throughout middle school. Uh, a lot of people would would think I'm their their good buddy. I was a big boy, and you know, but the upperclassmen, it was those grades ahead of me that would tend to be the ones to pick on me. Like they'd be the ones that would you know say some some mean words. Like I remember in when I was in fourth grade or fifth grade, I forget which grade it was, and I was a bit, I was probably two hundred some pounds at that point. So I was just a big guy, right? And my other my friends, I mean, I don't even know what the normal yeah be. probably right. i think i was probably well fifth grade actually i was bigger than that i was almost 300 pounds so um the upperclassman would i remember this one story where he would walk the hallways with his just one guy usually or with a friend usually two guys with with, with and a bunch of girls you know kind of following him around like they're strutting their stuff and they're trying to show off and things like that and I'm this young guy walking through the hallways, not making eye contact because I was too insecure and I didn't want them to pick on me. So I just stopped. Right. Um, so I just kind of avoided them, looked the other way, looked at the lockers. And and he stopped me. One of the guys stopped me one time and he flashed me a pornographic image of a woman and said, you're never going to have a woman one day and things like that. And I'm like, I didn't know what that meant at fifth grade. I didn't care what that meant at fifth grade. But at the same time, I'm like, those are girls. He showed me a picture of this and I'm like, this is weird. Like, okay. So I felt yeah. bad about myself right. and you know, it, it was just, and they all walked away laughing. Right. And I would also remember the moments where I had a bigger lower body and we had stairs in school and I would always try to wait for everybody to pass me before I climbed the steps because I was slower. And also they would make noises when I was walking up the stairs behind, you know, oh behind me. God. So yeah, there, there was some moments where as a young person, that scars you, right? There's, yeah. there's trauma in that too and insecurities that develop throughout that. So it was a little overwhelming and you take that with you. you know? Oh my gosh, yes. And it makes it so hard to go to school, you know, all the stress and anxiety. I mean, I got picked on when I was in seventh, sixth, seventh grade. I don't remember. I just remember I did not want to go to school. And, you know, your parents, they're just going about their life. And they're like, no, you got to go to school. And you're like, that is the last place. Like, please homeschool me. <laughs> Yeah, that's just the, so what age were you when all of the transformations started to happen? Yeah, I was 16. So um, I was actually homeschooled for a few years in high school, just okay. because I mean, I, I didn't want to go back to school because of someone of how people viewed me. Also, it became more difficult for me to move around. Right. Also became difficult for me to accept that I have uh, uh, anxiety. Like I had really bad anxiety. And so I couldn't control that. So me being in school at that point in my life just accentuated everything. Right. And so it wasn't a good, it was just a perfect storm for me to just be going down the track. I didn't need to go down. Mm -hmm. So I was homeschooled for a couple years. And then, um, so that was about 14 to about 16. Uh, okay. so, and then at that point, well, that's when I was in, that was when I was starting to be homeschooled at that point. That's when I got really large. I had to go to the hospital. I finished school several years after that, uh, okay. at a charter school, but yeah. Did, did obesity run in the family at all? So yeah, okay. so my mom's side of the family was a little, they all seem to struggle with obesity. Okay. Uh, my mom is a bigger person. 
my dad, you know, just has like the normal dad bod. <laughs> so <laughs> he just gets away with that. He's okay. But yeah, my mom's side of the family, diabetes, and, okay. and obesity. And, and yeah, so that, that side has a little more of that in there. Okay. So when you were talking about when you were heavy, that you had anxiety, yeah. are, do you still struggle with anxiety or did you go through a transformation mentally and physically? That's a really good question. So I would love, so we're all about being transparent and vulnerable and real, right? Like I yes. think sometimes we think, I think sometimes we think that we have to be strong and say, oh yeah, got it covered. And <laughs> I will share that when I started with the anxiety and panic attack disorder, I had medications that I was on. I was on three or four different meds at that point at 14 and for a couple of years afterwards. I don't like how it made me feel. So I decided to, against best wishes or doctor's recommendations, mm -hmm. I kind of said, I'm not going to do this anymore. And eventually I found ways to cope. But so looking back from where I was to where I'm at today, um, do I still have anxiety and panic attacks? Yes. I still get them periodically, but they're in different situations than they used to be. It's no longer like this fear of, oh, I'm going to die. Like that's what it was back then. Mm. Today, it's more like, oh, there's real life going around. Oh my goodness, like this is crazy, you know? And, and after a while, it can build up and you kind of have a hard time breathing and you just need to kind of find ways to cope with that. So yes, I still get them, but not as, I would say they're very minimal and I found ways to control them. It still likes to peek its ugly head periodically. And I don't think we're ever exempt from no. the possible temptations that used to come our way or the things that we used to struggle with, right? But we just find a different way to to figure out how to get them out of the way, how to deal with them. Do you see yourself as you are or do you see yourself as the bigger kid? It's funny. I'm going to tell you this. So I'm... <laughs> I some I just got over this probably within the last several years. When I I mean I'm down to like 201, whatever, 203, 202, whatever. I'm between that that group right now of, of weight numbers. But I still, not right now, but this last couple of years, I remember sitting on beds and being like really cautious like because I didn't want to break them because I broke I've I've sat on beds before and they and that was so embarrassing and it was yes. my friend's house and I broke a bed and two of them maybe three of them in my life and and you know and um chairs their their wheel their legs would bend you know and I just remember and, and seat belts always couldn't always be buckled like those are the things that are were, were really weird ingrained or, they were ingrained yes, and you they become the that's the, that's the the traumatic thoughts that come from mm -hmm. those moments because we weren't designed to live like that that's not right. supposed to be us but unfortunately we're dealt some cards that we've chosen sometimes to get us to that place but there's a way out and i'm going to be an example of hope to that but i remember you know those moments and they they were in my head and even walking in stores and walking in public places people would always like kind of stop and stare and i that's one thing I probably still think about, right? Like, oh boy, I think they're going to be staring at me here. You know, it kind of goes to my head. But I had to get over that and recognize over time, like, you're not that guy anymore. You yeah. know, you're not, you're not 799 pounds. You're not 700 pounds. You're not 600 pounds anymore. Like you're in a really decent spot in your life and you have to walk as you are, right? So. Wow, gosh, I can't imagine what a mind trick that would be. When you live half your life one way, and then yeah. now you're, you're brand new and mentally, physically, everything, and you're helping people, which I think is so admirable. It's not just that you did it for you and you're like, okay, all done. <laughs> you're helping other people and you can relate to those people when they are at their worst or having cravings. Um, so yeah, do you still have battles with food in your mind or is it you don't even crave that junk it's really awesome in my life right now with food like because i i kind of go back and you kind of you revisit you do kind of this um audit on yourself right and you kind of look at your background and you're and you're thinking when i used to do this this brought xyz result to me so there's only so much of that you can take before your life just gets thrown down the drains and you just kind of, you just count on that stuff. Right. So I had to come to a good place where I had to identify that food 
was something that I consumed and it did not consume me. And that triggers me to make a better decision. Now, is Justin perfect at everything he eats? Absolutely not. (laughs) But I know my limitations. I know what foods bring me life, what foods bring me death. I know what brings me uh, my satisfaction to feeling better, looking better, feeling more confident versus ones that make me feel ill or not so good or not confident. And so there's this balance today where I maybe take one day out of maybe usually it's a Saturday and I'll have, you know, my wife makes cookies because she likes to, you know, bake for her cookie business. And and I, I sometimes will have one or two of those and nice size cookies, right? So they're okay. And that would be totally enough for me. And then the rest mm-hmm. of the day, maybe I'll have maybe something else, maybe a slice of pizza or two if that's around. But honestly, it's not this huge, I have to have it. I'm not like a cookie monster anymore about it. I got, give me, I'm more like, <laughs> let's just, you know, here and there and treat it in moderation. Because if I were to continue giving in to what cost me, almost cost me my life back in the day, I don't want to give it power anymore. And I don't want to go to that place anymore. So you kind of have this, this line in the sand, right? And you're like, Mm-mm, I'm not crossing that boundary line. Now, what if I do? That's the question. What if, what if I do step over that line? Well, that just means that I need to be mindful enough to say, I took a step over that. I need to forgive myself. I need to have grace and mercy on myself. And I need to take a step backwards, get behind that line again, because I know what crossing that barrier, what that entails and what that gets me to. So I do have a different relationship with food today. I am not, and I I will proudly say this, I am not addicted anymore to it. If the temptation does come my way, I know what to do with that. And I remember where it brought, where it took me before. And I remember what it took to get out of that. And I don't want to go back. Yeah. That's what made her. Definitely. What, what do you do if a craving strikes, if you're like, oh my gosh, I don't know what your, your biggest weakness was. Yeah. It sugar. Was it sweet sugar? It was anything, honestly. Anything. Okay. Chips, sugar, donuts. I mean, I yeah. don't care. What, what do you cookies. do then? <laughs> do you get the craving? Where do you, what do you do? Do you go for a walk? So what I do now is there's a couple different things I do actually to, to help with that. Um, number one is my prayer life gets better, right? Because I know sometimes I'm not even hungry. I need this. I'm I'm relying on food to bring me comfort instead of the one who made me. So there's that part of my life. So I know there's that that's like more the mental and spiritual mm-hmm. aspect of it. And I'll be real, sometimes I'm not connected to that. So that didn't help me at that point. I know God's listening and I know he wants to answer, but me, I'm like, eh, uh, yeah, okay, I prayed. Okay, that's enough, right? Because that's that's a real thing. I think we do that. We kind of just yeah. put things out there and maybe we don't really believe it in our hearts or want to, you know, go that direction. But then there's like the, the other things that, okay, if I know my heart's not in a good place for that, what do I do then? So then I say, I find a substitution because if you're at a place where you're just like, I'm going to eat something no matter what. And I don't care right now. I'm strong enough right now to find substitutions. And so not saying that apples taste like brownies, not saying that carrots (laughs) taste like donuts, but uh, I do tend to go for like, you know, I'll, I'll pick up maybe an apple with peanut butter or I'll pick up a, um, maybe three hard boiled eggs, you know, mm-hmm. and, and, and I'll consume that. And sometimes, it, and this is very rare, maybe once every three months this happens. I don't have these moments so much anymore, but I'll, I'll make myself a little bit more than satisfied with food on healthier items like eggs and protein and maybe some Greek yogurt and an apple mm-hmm. or carrots. And I'll feel so satisfied, not quite full. And then that takes away that craving I have and it just passes. Like I'm satisfied, right? A couple other things I do would be, I take protein bars that are more natural protein bars and like they kind of have that gig of a candy bar. And if you just use your imagination, you can make them like a candy bar, right? They're not quite <laughs> there, but it still gives me that trick. There's still, there's just something about it. And, and a lot of it's mental. A lot of it's mental. It, you, uh, you almost all of it that, is mental. You know? Yeah. So I do that stuff. And like you said, go for a walk is great because I can, I can clear my head, put some music on, put a podcast on, huh, Don? Yeah. We got some good podcasts going on here. You know, listen to some episodes, go for a walk. I love doing that. Go pray, go be in nature. Um, and time passes. Like you're Mm -hmm. walking an hour, you're on the phone to somebody, listening to music, listen to podcasts. Distract. It's gone. Right. And it's gone. So 
that's those are the three i would say three four main main alternatives that i play here substitutes that really help me um stay the course yeah i've done like an elimination diet tweaks before and when you start reintroducing those things you feel like crap I mean, not all the time, but there's times where it's like, oh, wow, this is, this makes me actually feel like garbage. I feel like I have to lay in bed all day. So that can help give you some motivation to stay on the right path too, because you know, oh, I know that that's going to be making me feel like I have to be in the bathroom for two hours or whatever it is. So I think, um, learning to listen to your body is huge. Oh, you're just dragging too, right? Like you were saying how you feel the next day. It's like, you know, I've never been a big drinker, just never really got into it. But there were moments where I may have had a little too much, right? Where I feel like, okay, I know this wasn't, this was probably a glass more than I should have had. Then the next day you kind of wake up like you're, oh my goodness, I don't feel good. Like we don't like that feeling, right? right. For most people that'll, that'll knock them on the head and say, be careful next time. So it's the same way with food, right? It's like, okay, um, that made me feel like this. And you know, it interrupts my sleep. If I eat mm-hmm. too late in the night, especially after, after like four or five o'clock and I'm eating sugar and ice cream or whatever, I have a hard time sleeping. And when you don't sleep and you feel gross from what you just consumed in, in a huge amount of food or whatever, mm-hmm. it's not a good recipe for the next day. You're grumpy, you're tired, you take it out on your kid, take it out on your spouse, take it out on your friends. You just don't want to be with people. It's just it's not good. It's a sabotage, you know, and, and we don't want to go that direction. So I, no. you're exactly right. I think about that and I'm like, you got to be smarter than a temptation. You got to outwit yourself. You can trick yourself. You can outwit yourself. It's possible. And that's right. how you get across, you know, that finish line. Yeah, it is so mental. Um, and we were talking before I hit record about sugar, you know, I've been trying to do more and more episodes about sugar, you know, as you, as a little kid having panic attacks and anxiety and all that stuff, sugar messes with your brain. That is definitely a reason right there to deter yourself because it can really make everything go wonky. There's that, that pleasure center of the brain is that the dopamine effect that happens Mm -hmm. from consuming certain foods or doing certain things that are like pleasure. So when you do something that's pleasurable, you eat, um, you know, sex, you can go for a nice walk or, you know, a hobby, whatever it is that brings a pleasure point to the body that, that dopamine effect hits. I was like, Oh, you know, and, and food can, can trigger that. And especially amazing, tasty, sugary food, right? Yeah, That's you get yeah. into or every, it tickles the taste buds and makes you feel so good. And they, they're not silly. Let's be realistic with the food companies out there. The industry knows what it takes to get these people to come back. So every little taste bud is tickled and then yeah. you get more and you feel good about it. And it's part of that brain chemistry that, that they just know. And so that's why I try to stay away from that stuff because I know in the pleasure center of my brain, I'm going to be like, this is good. This is real good. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't like the results from it. <laughs> so tell me about, you wrote a couple of books, you said? Yeah. Let's yeah, hear about them. I love yeah, it when people so, write books. I think that's amazing. So this one is, I mean, I'm going to do a revised version, new cover and everything kind of feels like it's 1950 still, but uh, <laughs> this, this impacted me because I like purple and I was like, it worked at the time, but this is called <laughs> Made in His Image. Okay. This okay. is one of my, this is the last one I, I created. And it's more of a workbook, but this one is in regards to body shaming. It's in regards to accepting, um, accepting where you're at, but not saying I'm going to stay there. Right. And it's, it's also about body image. So I, I tried, I walked through my own personal story with this one and, and I had to evaluate, you know, how I was feeling about myself, how I was very insecure about myself. I was very insecure about what I was wearing because my clothes, you know, I, I looked too big for certain clothes and I cared about what people thought of me. And I just, I was living in this really self-conscious fear of, of my appearance and I was in bondage to that. Like mm-hmm. I really thought I was the most hideous thing out there and and mm-hmm. I didn't like who I became. And and no matter what people would tell me, you're a good looking guy. Oh, you're a nice guy. You're you're this. We love you. We care about you. It didn't impact me in a yeah. in any capacity in a sense of my image. And you know, you're my parents, you have to say that. You're my brother, you have to say, that. you're my girlfriend, you have to say that. Right? That's what goes on in the head. Yeah. But I had to come to a point where The body shaming had to end. The fear and insecurities had to end, but they didn't end like that. 
it takes work and effort. So I wrote this book called Made in His Image, identifying what, number one, what God says about you, and then what you can take from there is your value system, and you can operate out of the value system of who you're supposed to be, so you can be set free from the other stuff. And I'll tell you what, even if you're not a believer and you look at this, it's still a lot of good information and it's still good stuff to apply to your life, right? It's just, it just goes hand in hand with what we need to become. We need mm -hmm. to be better people, not care so much what other people think of us, not care so much what, you know, oh, I'm not wearing the right clothes. I'm not caring so much about, oh, I'm not driving the best car. Because right. we find our identity in that. And mm -hmm. I can't and you can't and we can't afford to do that because we rob ourselves of peace and rob other people from experiencing the best you because you're too focused on you. Whoa, yeah. that was <laughs> Tweet that, Ellen. <laughs> tweet it. <laughs> oh, that excellent. was so good. It's not, you're not just doing yeah. it for you. You're doing it for everybody around you that has to experience you or gets to experience you. That's phenomenal. I love that. Are you proud of yourself? You know, I I'm a, I'm proud of the accomplishments. Right, like I can look at my life and say, Justin, good job, buddy. Right, I can say that. But I try really hard not to puff myself up to the point where I think I'm all that in a bag of low fat chips. <laughs> I don't know. What to say. What a do bag you say of now? carrots. <laughs> a bag of carrots, right? I mean, I know the accomplishment's amazing. I know people will look at that and they'll say, you know, did a really good job. I always point them back to the one who's who really um, saved my life. And I say, that's Jesus. And I point them back to what he did for me. Um, and I also recognize that there's a sense of humility that, um, is okay to say, you know, I did work hard, right? I did work hard and I do appreciate the journey. And I do, I am proud of becoming someone different, mm -hmm. but I don't want to ever boast in that to say that I'm perfect. And I'm like the ultimate answer because honestly, I'm not, I'm still a human being just like you, right? Just like those mm -hmm. listening. And I don't, I do the same thing. I sleep in a bed and I put my clothes on and all that yeah, stuff. Right? right. So yeah, I'm a proud of my accomplishments. Yes. It's really cool to, to walk through this journey and be on the other side of it now and look back and say that guy over there, you know, he's no longer alive. Like that's the old me. This is a new mm -hmm. me. So that just feels good. I'll give you that. It feels amazing. Yeah. Well, I think it's great. Um, so for those that are not, um, religious, you, mm -hmm. you can just, bypass this part, but what, what was it that have you always been religious? What was it that you, you felt like God and Jesus were completely part of your process? At first I never, like, I remember, and I think anybody can relate to this. And you know, if you're a seeker, if you're not a Christian, you know, like there's a point where you just got to say, you know what, I can respect this person's views. Like I hear different views every day and yes. we can agree to disagree, or we can love on each other and just end of the day, high five. Okay. Right. So I always, my mom and dad had a picture of a painting of Jesus. A very, it's a very famous painting of an individual like uh, of Jesus. And it was sitting on the mantle all the time. And I, I remember one day, finally, after years of noticing it, finally asking my parents, who is that? Oh, that's Jesus. Oh, like we never talked about in our home much once in a while, maybe. Um, never went to church at that point either and didn't really pray much, but we had a picture. Um, and so <laughs> I remember having some kind of curiosity to that. Right. And it was yeah. just, okay. All right. So then in my heart as a young person, I was like, so God, there's a God somewhere, like a big question mark in the sky. That's all I knew at that point. And it brought me comfort though, knowing that we're not alone on this earth and we don't just turn to worm child and we die. Like I, I had that belief right. even as a kid. Um, and then later on in life, when you start going through the process of just living life and, and having hard times and other people coming across your path and sharing what, what this God person or whomever is, mm -hmm. is doing in their lives and how they're feeling different now and acting different and feeling like this is amazing and that purpose. I didn't understand it as a kid. I'll be honest. I didn't understand it as a teenager much, but I did know when I was 14, I heard a message of Jesus that really attracted me. It was like, and I didn't believe it so much at first. I was kind of like, oh, uh, okay, mm -hmm. whatever. Um, nice, you know. But then when when the rubber meets the road, it's like my life, my life was going down a a path that was killing me. I was making a mess of my life. That's where I was at. I was making a mess of my life. And the way I was going was causing me destruction. It was causing me chaos. I wasn't at peace. I knew I was lost. 
I went to doctors, psychiatrists, psychologists. I went to everyone. They couldn't just seem, we couldn't find a pinpoint and answer as to what's going on in Justin. We have medications for him. We have different certain diets he can follow. We have certain treatment plans he can follow. But this still didn't hit the the inner part that needed healing, right? The 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 wounds there and it's exposed. And I could put a band-aid over that if I wanted to, but there needs to be some kind of surgery inside that needs to repair that before it heals on the outside. And I remember where I was just like in my life, I was like, you know, I don't know. I don't know this guy that much. I but God, if you're present, if you're real, Jesus, I just ask you to come into my life and change my life. Forgive me of my wrongs. I know I haven't been perfect. <laughs> and I just need you to lead me. And it was a it was a very sincere prayer as a young man. And I didn't like who I was. And I was, I didn't know if I was gonna live or die. That's the problem when you're when you're 799, you're like, this is scary as a teenager, especially any age, really. Um, so I just gave it to somebody who actually cared about me. And I gave it to somebody who actually had meaning and purpose for my life. And I never looked back at that. Am I a perfect Christian? Absolutely not. I get upset sometimes. I may say a bad word once in a while. Um, I may think thoughts that aren't good sometimes. But ultimately, I just want to please God. And I want to live on this earth to show him to other people and show them there's a hope to get out of where they're at. That, I mean, that's my life's been changed that much. So that's right. where I'm at today with my faith walk. And that's how I became more of a, a follower. Gosh, wow, that's beautiful. Um, can you give a piece of advice or what would you say to somebody that is in the shoes that you were in or maybe in a place where they feel hopeless and that they don't know where to turn or what they should do? Yeah, they're I was trying to I'm trying to go back and revisit that feeling that I had at that point in my life when I was at my lowest. And you know, my body I was I was really big. I was at my biggest, but at my lowest at the same time, right? Like you're yeah. at your lowest mentally, biggest physically. Um, remember the just the the feelings I had of not feeling adequate, feeling like I'm a I'll just be, I mean, I'm gonna be totally raw. I felt like I was just a fat lard sitting on a bed. Okay. Mm-hmm. Like that was my thought process. I was a a fat freak. Like I, these are the words that came across my mind. Um very you know, not, not good words to speak over yourself. Right. Um, and I had to get to a place where I knew that physically I wasn't, I wasn't healthy. I knew Mm -hmm. that I didn't look the healthiest. I knew that I couldn't find my identity. Even at that age, I couldn't find my identity in what I looked like at that moment. Cause if I did that, I would call myself those words. Mario right. Waddles, what other people would call me in school became, right. you know, traveled with me through my time as a teenager. So I had to remember that that wasn't really me. I, that, that's just a physical, that's where I'm at right there. That's where I'm at right now. I may be, my weight's not good, all this stuff, but I know there's a way out of this. And so you have to come to a place in your heart and your mind to recognize I may not be at the perfect point in my life right now. I may be in trouble. I may be, you know, up a creek without a paddle. (laughs) And I might just be in some chaos right now and not be who I'm supposed to be. But I can make a decision right now. This is where I would, this is where, this is what I did to get to a better place. I had to make a decision right now to operate out of a different mindset. I can't find value in this because finding value in this keeps me rooted in, 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 mm-hmm. in a prison of myself here. But if I look past that and see the potential in myself, now I have hope. And so you have to choose to find the hope out of the whole situation and accepting where you're at, but not staying where you're at. You know, that that's, we can't, so many people walk around sometimes and they're like, well, I'm just who I am. I'm me. I'm never going to change. I don't like that. I don't either. <laughs> I don't like that. It's a I'm cop like, out. Yeah. It's like, a cop oh, out. I'm never going to, I'm never going to be different. You know, I make God maybe this way. I mean, first off, you have so much value in you and so much potential in you and you're wasting it by accepting who you are today. I'm not saying your personality has to change. We're all different. We all mm-hmm. have unique personality traits, skills, all that stuff. Like you can become a better you having your same personality. It just mm-hmm. gets chiseled, right? It gets chiseled in certain areas. Like a like you're working on a project. It's like, okay, all right, this gets taken off here. You become a little more rooted here. You don't fly off the handle so much over here, right? Right, <laughs> but, uh, right. It's possible. Yeah. Work so- in progress. Exactly. So yeah, you identify who, where you're at, and then 
you have to make the conscious decision to say, I know I can be better than this. There's potential for me. And you got to really believe that it doesn't happen overnight. Might feel awkward to think it. <laughs> it did me, but you get to a point where you're like, I'm starting to believe it. It's the subconscious. It's neuroplasticity of the brain that happens. New thoughts begin to be rewired. They, your mm -hmm. thoughts begin to be rewired. You get to replace those old thoughts with new thoughts. And 99% of a health journey of becoming healthier is mental. 1% is physical. Because if you defeat yourself mentally, there's no starting the physical. You can't, you can't do one from the other. Yeah, I 100% believe that. And I think we're all proficient in talking terrible to ourselves. Like I, I would never let anybody talk to you, even you, the way that I talk about myself and I don't even know you. It's like, what are we doing? Why are we doing that? Yeah. But we are our worst critics and that's where it has to stop. Stop yeah. beating your own self up and be your own cheerleader. You know, Don, I just found, I found a study today talking about mindset there. And you can Google this. I don't know who actually did this study, but I looked at it today on multiple different sources. Um, age, as we get older, if you want to hit your 60s, 70s, and 80s, right, we'll hit that generation. And I think as time goes on, as you age, people age and they feel like my life just doesn't have as much meaning anymore. My life doesn't contribute so much anymore. You know, I'm achy. I'm tired. Uh, the kids are gone. You know, they're out of the house now. We don't have the energy. You know, all those negative thoughts that come, I'm getting washed up. I don't have anything to offer you're retired, right? Like their purpose is gone and the feeling of their work. And there was a study completed saying how the mind, how, where you're at with your mind dictates the potential of your potential survival. So for instance, if you think as you're a 70, 80 year old person, if you think that age is going to just kill you and you're pretty much washed up, you lose years of your life. It's powerful, the mind. You lose years of your life, seven plus years of your life. Mm. If you think positive and optimistic about your age, hey, I'm achy, but I'm going to find ways to adapt. Hey, I still contribute. I'm going to go volunteer. Hey, you know what? I have a lot of knowledge and experience that I can offer that so-and-so person over there who's in her 20s that needs some help. You know what? I, I you, you know what I'm saying? Like, I'm not yeah. washed up. You're speaking differently. You're believing something different. They found, studies show, that person increased their life expectancy seven plus years. Wow. It's amazing. That is amazing. <laughs> it's, like, it's the mind, right? It's, it's, it just blows me away how powerful the mind can be. Ah, I have loved talking to you so much. I am inspired by you even more than I was just seeing the physical transformation. You just have a great outlook and it's inspiring. So kudos mm -hmm. to you. I love it. Thanks. I mean, it's, it's just, uh, you know, just awesome to be on here and, yeah. and just to give a, be a, have a platform to share a story to help other people. That's where we're at. Yeah. So tell people how they can find you where, where like your book and anywhere else. Yeah. yeah. So my books are on Amazon. So if you just type in Justin Willoughby, you're going to find Amazon books. I have three or four different books out that you can check out, um, physical copies, eBooks as well. You know, a lot of it talks about my other book right now, which is also becoming revised. These are kind of a couple of years old now, but this is my biography mixed with my my plan of eating and exercise that worked for me to help me lose fat and get healthier. So it's called One Step: How I Took One Step to Lose Six Hundred Pounds. So you can check that out. Um, so yeah, that's my those are my books. I I have my own podcast out there too that I like to drop once in a while, just having interviews like you do, but in the health section. Okay. And Don, guess what? I got to have you on because <laughs> that's great. <laughs> Um, oh, yes. that'd be fun. Be I'd love amazing. that. Yeah. So yeah, 600 pounds down podcast. And then also if people just want to be encouraged or want to reach out for questions, um, I'm available on socials all the time. Like I, I use that as a full-time ministry opportunity just to reach people. Sure. Right. And so, um, Instagram it's 600 pounds down, uh, Facebook it's, just facebook.com backslash Justin Willoughby. You can find me on there as my name. I was a lucky one to get my name. I was excited. Uh, it's the it makes, little things. It is the little things. That's right. And I, I coach people through food addiction. I coach people through health and wellness. So I offer a lot for people, um, but it has to be the right time for them, right? Like there's mm -hmm. never, I never force myself on people. It's simply just when they knock, we'll have a simple conversation and it might not be coaching that they receive. It might just be the podcast. It might just be a book and that's okay. That's enough for them. Right. But every Avenue is covered for any possibility that might want to, you know, take place there. Right. Right. Yeah. That's awesome. We'll send all that to me so I can put it in the show notes so that people can find you. I have 
thoroughly enjoy talking to you. This has just been so eye opening and inspiring. So thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to talk to me. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Don. It's been a pleasure. Thank All you. All right. We'll be in touch. Bye-bye. I hope you enjoyed the episode. If you did, please give it a like. And if you have not yet subscribed, subscribe. Have you subscribed yet? Please do. I'd love to have you on board. And if you have any ideas, suggestions, input, leave it in the comments below. Have a good day.